Okay, good afternoon again. So I think it's time, time to start the webinar. Uh, my name is Pekka Manen from CSC, which is the Supercomputing Center in Finland. And uh, in this series of three webinars, we're gonna discuss um, the main ingredients of performance optimization of scientific software. And today uh, we are gonna talk about performance analysis. And uh, got a question in the beginning, how long is the webinar se uh, session? I think uh, it will be around three quarters, so 45 minutes. So a bit longer than typical webinars, but uh, uh, less than an hour, I would say. So uh, let me start off um, <clears throat> the, the series with some introduction to the uh, webinars themselves, but first a uh, small story. So a day in life uh, at CSC happened truly really to me, so not an urban, urban legend, uh, perhaps two years ago or something, and I got a customer ticket on a person performing simulations using a Fortran code. And uh, the problem is that they, he, well, um, the user uh, wanted uh, us to purchase a library, uh, one particular math, math library, for, because the random number generation has been slowed down of when changing the systems. Well, it didn't sound that plausible to me because um, because the uh, new system back then, so if you remember Murska, and this was on, on Taita, so the old system was definitely much, much slower in terms of, of single core performance. And uh, while well, we enrolled into a discussion of random, random generation, but then I just like uh, cut down it and uh, asked whether uh, the user had profiled the code, so uh, whether the user is, is really certain that the, it was really due to random number generation. Okay, it turned out that, that wasn't well, wasn't the case, so I asked for the code uh, profiled, and uh, it looked that in in fact uh, it didn't have anything to do with random number generation. So basically, all the execution time was spent on these lines in the in the code. And uh, if you look at the code, if knowing Fortran, so you see that on the innermost loop, there's no reference to the indices i and j, so they are kind of on just like an extra iteration. So repeating the innermost two loops over and over again. And uh, after removing, just removing these four lines, the execution time of one simulation reduced from 17 hours to three seconds. So basically the uh, story, is something that uh, application performance is something that you should uh, be aware of. Uh, you and uh, definitely something that you should mind when doing high performance computing or scientific computing in general. And uh, in this webinar series, we're gonna gonna have a walk through on on things related to it. So today we're gonna discuss uh, how to analyze the performance of your applications. And then in, in a, a couple of weeks from, from that, we're gonna discuss uh, what to do when we have analyzed some performance bottlenecks. And on the last part, um, we're gonna talk about how to improve parallel application scaling. So empty, parallel scalability of, of MPI codes. So you can watch them all as a series, or you can cherry pick things like listening something today and, and something from here and so on. And uh, the underlying assumption here is, is that we work on the on the CSC's uh, Cray XC40 platform, SISU. But uh, many or most of the things are general enough that they are applicable to other supercomputers and other platforms uh, as well, even on your laptop. And uh, one thing perhaps um, different to many webinars is that we have an uh, optional hands-on component of the of the uh, webinar. So on the webinar page, there's an uh, exercise assignment sheet and, and the related code. So uh, you can do that uh, while sort of between the uh, between the uh, webinar sessions. But uh, some further instructions about it in, at the end of the seminar. 
So uh, let's get started properly. So why should I care about application performance? Well, obvious things are that if you got that fast code, it just enables you to do more science at the same time. As in the in the uh, in my story, the if <coughs> if the uh, throughput was was improved from waiting for 17 hours for getting some more statistics or a bit more results to three seconds. So how much more you can do sampling on the time if you can run like a tens of, of the um, tens of samples with different parameters on in the in the sort of a much shorter time. So just like makes your makes your research life more proactive while you don't have to uh, wait for for the results. Also, from the point of view of the service provider, of course, it's in our interest that that the users of using our systems are using them as efficiently as possible. And for kind of a common interest in, in a way that it's while well, the supercomputers do consume electricity and therefore produce carbon dioxide emissions. So uh, just saving saving resources is of everybody's good. And also there's a kind of a non-obvious ones, not just like um, <clears throat> saving things, is, is that uh, if you got a code that has a reputation of being a fast and good code. It's a kind of an, uh, a good business card for you. So it opens doors for kind of a collaboration opportunities and, and so on. And uh, when you do the exercise of, of really optimizing an application, even if it's a kind of a legacy code, so not written by yourself from the uh, from the scratch, but uh, it's somebody else started and uh, you've been just contributing it, just like it makes you uh, dwell deeper in the code and then really understand what's happening over the uh, in the different parts of the code and what are the, in the interactions between different parts and the of the code and the, uh, the underlying hardware. Um, so what is performance optimization is all about is that we got the scientific problem and uh, we want to adapt it to the target uh, platform in an as efficient manner as possible. And there are a couple of uh, intertwined factors. Where does the application performance or lack of performance raise from is, is of course, uh, choosing the algorithm. So what kind of an uh, computational method you are using for the same thing. So you can cast things in a, in a way that uh, they may be scaling in a, in a in terms of the problem in a in a uh, in a different manner, there may be trade-offs, uh, but uh, you just like a, need to know the your case such that you pick the best possible algorithm. And uh, once you have the kind of the uh, paper and pen stuff done, so it's all about the implementation and the implementation efficiency. There are a couple of factors for the for the performance. So how well you use the processing unit, so whether you employing the cycles, the vector units, so on and so on. Uh, the memory hierarchy of, of the CPUs is extremely complex, so it really does matter how do you do the memory reference. So if you refer to a memory location, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of considerations there, how efficient is this reference. And uh, I'm talking about supercomputers here, so we are we have a, another layer of, of complexity in terms of parallelism. So does your code scale and does it scale as good as it can? And uh, last but not least mentioned here is is how do you do your file IO? So typically in, in high performance applications, that's a very, very typical bottleneck that many things are in basically in shape, but the uh, file, uh, file uh, IO kills everything. And uh, these things is something that we start to first analyze, perhaps identifying the bottlenecks and then talking about some, some tip, tips and tricks how to hopefully uh, alleviate this, this bottlenecks. And um, some, uh, miscellaneous uh, thoughts on, on the optimizing a code. So the 
everything is, is pretty much interdependent. So, so there's an dependencies on the selected algorithm, uh, its implementation, and then the system itself. So which kind of a compiler you choose, which libraries you are referring to, and how, how well this uh, complex framework is, is really fitting to the hardware you're running on. And um, kind of a first take home message is that performance is not portable. So some things are uh, kind of an universally faster, but many things are related uh, or dependent on what kind of a platform you're running. So some things, things may be faster on a CPU family. Uh, and if you, then there's an next generation CPUs coming and then the sele selections are not optimal anymore. So rule of sort of an take home lesson number one. So optimize for a given platform. But much more important take home message if you don't remember many things from, from the seminar and you don't want to uh, watch the recording again. So one, one thing to uh, really, one of the key things to bear in mind is that uh, the premature code optimization is the root of all evil in a sense that you are supposed to not optimize while you write code, but only after you have a working code you find the parts of the code that are relevant, relevant for the total execution time and then optimize only those. So clarity, elegance are the driving principles of also scientific software, but the uh, difference in scientific software is that you employ the uh, 9 to 10 rule and focus on this 10% of lines that spent the, uh, where the 90% of the execution time is, is being spent and optimize these 10% of the, of the codes. So clear, clear uh, readable code everywhere and then find the bottlenecks and optimize it in there. Okay, and uh, in this, basically the rest of the talk is we, we try to identify now this uh, 90, or, or this uh, where we, which which are these ten percent of the lines, the code lines where the most of the time is being spent on, and then build on to, towards the next uh, sessions and how to sort of an, trying to figure out the uh, figure out the possible co causes or possible low hanging fruits where I could make this code running faster within this this hotspot. Um, and uh, towards that, so the first considerations about the performance analysis. And uh, well, first things first, you need to know how much time the code uh, really takes running uh, some given example problem or, or test, test problem, uh, problem. So it's difficult to know whether you're doing better if you don't know the, um, whether you're doing fast or not faster or not. And uh, what one can do is have built-in timers, just code it in the program. So just using the MPAW time or some uh, uh, the clock style functions of, of different programming languages, or just uh, take the true bulk of time from system comments like the Unix time or some past system statistics. But nonetheless, uh, before you're doing something, you have to, that, that's kind of the, what matters at the end of the day. So whether the workload time is being reduced or not when optimizing something. Uh, but uh, you, sooner or later, you have to also rely on, on the built-in timers. So in order to get a bit more fine-grained information, uh, so you need to, you probably want to know uh, to, timings over given uh, routines, uh, functions and so on. And, um, but, but that's not the end of the story. So you're gonna need some further information because that's, you know, whether something is getting faster or not, but you don't know the reason of, of, of the speed up or, or what sort of fun 
could be a cause for an, uh, performance and optimality. Uh, so we are going to need tools and uh, there's, there's a set of uh, different choices for well applications that that, uh, that are refer referred to as performance analysis tools but uh, I'm gonna have a slide in a, in, a, uh, in a moment that lists possible choices but all of these mentioned uh, tools work in a pretty much the same philosophy so they add uh, just well the analysis tool so the application adds into your application into your code adds, uh, adds some special measurement code to the uh, binary that you have built uh, and uh, once you have this kind of an instrumented binary so that has mangled by the analysis tool so you run it and then this uh, instrumentation makes it to collect information what did happen uh, during the runtime of the of the of the application and we talk about uh, profiles so what kind of an events uh, how much of certain events did happen over the execution time or we can uh, sometimes able to record the whole trace so what did happen on a given uh, timestamp in the, in, during the execution and then these tools uh, once they have this measurement data that's not readable by humans yet but the same, same tools will provide you some kind of an analysis reports perhaps text-based or some kind of an, uh, with, with some, some kind of a GUI information and uh, the often used, I don't know if this is a comprehensive list or not, but uh, some pointers for you. So the Cray XE platform, Sisu, has a really nice tool kit, one of the most advanced. It's called the Cray PAT, Cray Performance Analysis Tools. Uh, the documentation is, is online, but also if you when you are logged on Sisu, you just type man intro underscore cray, but you're gonna get this kind of a starting pain, uh, point for, for man pages. And it has its this kind of an interactive uh, documentation, also uh, documentation utility uh, <coughs> inbuilt. Uh, other alternatives that you can install yourself on your own computers. Uh, not available directly available on Sisu, are known as uh, something uh, well pretty old and then famous software called Skalaska. It's an open source alternative. Uh, Paraver is something that comes from uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, also an open source alternative. And Intel has its own uh, proprietary tools uh, that have, have a reputation of, of being quite advanced. So there are alternatives in uh, around uh, the exercise that I'm going to give is, is going to use or introduce you to use using the Graypad. But uh, like I said in the in uh, some time ago, is that um, most of these tools do work in the in the kind of the same philosophy. So basically, it's you you will be able to get the same information no matter the um, selection of the tools. There may be, of course, differences in the, uh, how they work, uh, perhaps even, even so the, how they perform on, on how, how good they are in analyzing a given performance bottleneck. But nonetheless, so there's, there's an uh, information that so there's a kind of couple of general uh, rules of thumb in, in analyzing the performance that I'm gonna walk through in the, in the uh, rest of the talk. Um, and the first thing is is that uh, you, well, uh, the, after the sort of the zero order information, that's the application timing. The really the next information what you're gonna need for for doing anything related to performance is that uh, is to determine which routines, so functions. Uh, and if you're a Fortran guy, so subroutines and so on, 
uh, consume the most of the execution time. So what is the re uh, relation or kind of a uh, proportional uh, intensity, uh, in, in, intensity of, of this different user or, or functions you don't have the user functions maybe something that you have written yourself or it's something if you call for a library numerical library or something else so whereabouts in the code the timing is being spent so never ever get uh, think of an application such it should be somehow evenly distributed over the code so there will be there will be hotspots in every single application so some lines of code just uh, executed or the time is being spent on 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 some parts of the code than the other ones. And this is something that's pretty hard to hard go or sort of build your what you can do it just by programming the only application, but it's much more convenient to use this uh, privilege and mentioned performance analysis tools for for recording this profile. And that typically is that you recompile or relink the code, so instrument it with, with this uh, uh, application and then do one or more runs in order to get get the profile and uh, get the profile in a, <clears throat> a bit further information in the, on the, about the profile. And um, you can do profiling in uh, two manners or even combining these. So one is the lightweight option is just doing sampling. So just checking what, what happens in uh, checking the stack in every millisecond and see count, uh, just like a do statistics or sampling over the, over the code. And that's pretty lightweight and um, doesn't interfere the code, but uh, uh, maybe that it, if the sampling rate is not dense enough, uh, may maybe some, some important information may be just like a being slipped. So, so small functions that in, in fact have, have an, uh, important role uh, in, in the performance, but uh, to the sampling to just never hit them in a, in a sort of an, uh, at, at the, when, when they happened. So you may have a variation between from a run to another when, when doing sampling. The heavyweight option is, is called tracing. So all functions or selected functions are being traced. So this uh, it records uh, the when when the program enters and routine and when it ex exists it and so you really get the get the uh, proper timestamps for for all events in the in the program, but it's more intrusive, may cause more overhead, uh, and um, and also may produce too much data in the when we are talking about big applications and big runs. Um, and the tools that I mentioned are able to do both of these, and Graybat is able to do kind of a combination of these two approaches. Um, so uh, this, the, the, these were the basic considerations. So the, you need to know the execution time. You need to be able to record the profile of, the, of, of your application. But uh, how would I start if I would get to get an application and and trying to make it faster? And uh, I don't know how definite this is, but this is how I see the uh, the uh, code optimization works. Is that we find a good test case? I will elaborate all of these points in a, in a for, with the upcoming slides. Uh, and now I'm talking supercomputing applications. So I'm talking about uh, parallel applications running on a supercomputer. So I need, want to know well, what are the limits for the for the scalability of the application, and uh, also once having the kind of the limits of the of the uh, performance, uh, I want to start analyzing and understanding the performance if there's something I could do do to improve it. So uh, enter this performance analysis tool. So select a core count, uh, run the instrumented uh, binary or the code. With this, uh, I get some performance analysis data. And from this data, I try to identify the single core and scalability bottlenecks of the application. Drink coffee, try to 
fix some of one or more of those. Uh, drink more coffee, trying to get it right again. So trying to uh, validate and debug the code. And loop over as long as I uh, can't find anything anymore to improve uh, or run out of time or energy. Meaning that I have an, uh, some uh, local minimum of, of performance for, the, for a given test case of a given application. So it's an iterative process where you, because like, like I said, everything is intertwined in, in a way that if you change something to uh, fix a single core bottleneck, you do this so the profile may, will be a different uh, after uh, after optimizing it. So you have to re re-instrument, re-profile everything again, and the new bottlenecks may arise and then so on. And um, in the following, just a few more words on, on each of these steps. So there are a couple of considerations that you need to know when, when really enrolling into this business. Uh, choosing a test problem sounds trivial, but it's not. So the, if I profile on, on a toy data, it does not trigger the same performance uh, characteristics or profile as the real world data. So where you, what you're gonna use for your science. So therefore the data set that you use for the code optimization exercise or your work, uh, it, it should <coughs> resemble the intended use of the code. So do not profile on a toy problem with, with just like a toy problem. So it needs to be large enough for getting uh, exposed the limits of the scalability. But at the same time, it needs to be completed in a reasonable time. So, I mean, 10 minutes runtime starts to be kind of an, uh, on the limit of, of being doable. But a typical trick is, for instance, they, they can, uh, if you're talking about the simulation code, they can full blown model, but just like run it for a couple of time steps rather than the whole, uh, all the way to convergence or whatever you're doing. And uh, of course, taking this into, into account when, when doing this approach. Okay, the next step was about instrumenting the code, running it. And, uh, oh, sorry, next step would be about measuring the scalability. Uh, so, uh, how I see it is, is that uh, then, then take the application with this uh, selected test case and uh, go ahead and run it with different core cards. So this comes, uh, <clears throat> this is um, one real world code with the real world, uh, uh, real world uh, input data. Uh, if, and if I run it on, on CISO with different number of MPR ranks, uh, I see a smooth drop off of wall, wall time. But I, I, as you see, there's basically no difference. Not much, so if this is seconds and this number of course. So meaning that, okay, I get, get some speed up here, but uh, it doesn't really matter that much of uh, running it, better running it with 500 or 1000 cores. So I just like a gain, like a, just like a few seconds here. So now if I plot the same data in a manner that if, if I um, divide this, uh, so 500 seconds something, if I divide it by this, I get uh, just like a notion that this step from here is, is almost a factor of two. So doubling the number of courses it gives me a factor of two in performance. Also doubling the number of cores from here to here gives me a factor of two in performance almost also here. But then something happens between the 500, 500 and 1000 cores. So the scalability sort of an, uh, ends here. Uh, but this, of course, happens with all codes at some point of time. And most applications just like run out of steam much earlier than, than this particular application did. But uh, so you, this is a good exercise for everybody. Everybody who are using Sisu or any parallel computer do, do at some point of time. So more cores does not imply more speed uh, always. And that uh, all applications will run out of run out of the uh, parall parallelization capabilities. So just want to understand where does the scaling stop? 
And uh, in fact, I'm interested in, in the differences between these two points. So if this is something uh, that I could fix such that I can improve, uh, take this step a bit further up, meaning that I would get a bit more benefit still by, by running with 1000 cores rather than, than 500 cores. So it's, it's uh, we want to know, and uh, of course I want to uh, profile or do all the optimization with the core account that uh, re resembles the, the, uh, the sensible sensible usage of the code. So I'm probably gonna, gonna run my production runs with 500 cores, so with, with this, this problem, so meaning that I want to optimize everything uh, and running on a 500 course. Um, after finding the uh, scalability scalability limits, uh, it's time to uh, enter this um, performance analysis tool. So I instrumented with a chosen tool, in my cases, I typically use Crapet, but uh, of course, like I said, there are other all the alternatives and uh, up to you which one you choose, but uh, all of these work in the same manner. So I built this instrumented binary, run it with the uh, core count, where the scalability is still okay, and the core count where does the uh, scalability is not, or the parallelism is not bringing any more benefit for the, for the total execution time. And if I pro compare these pro profiles from these two runs side by side, so what are the differences between these pr two profiles? And in this information uh, lies the reason for the scalability bottleneck that I may or may not be able to remove. But if I am, it mean, means that I can uh, incorporate or employ harness more parallel, parallel core or more parallelism, meaning cores meaning that I gonna get a bit bit faster again when, when doing the production runs. The next step is, is the same <coughs> take the same data from from these runs. So the core count with scalability is still okay. And uh, uh, try to understand what's the uh, how well these hotspot routines of this profile are performing. So I want to focus on the on the routines that consume the significant uh, or sort of most of the total power uh, total time. So if it's less than five percent of the execution time, don't matter. So just focus on the ones that do matter in terms of the uh, uh, the total execution time. And uh, sometimes I can see right away what's the well, if, if there's an issue in the code, like in the beginning, it was pretty obvious. And the, in the story in the beginning, it was pretty obvious that, okay, I'm just like doing uh, uh, looping over in vain for way too many times. Uh, but if there's no kind of an mistakes in the code and I still would like to fix or improve something, uh, I would like to get a bit more information. And this is something we're gonna talk about in the, in the next, next um, webinar a bit, bit better, but just like some name dropping here. So whether something called, uh, whether the, uh, whether I'm using, for instance, the fast uh, cache memories as efficiently as possible. And also it's in, interesting to, uh, and important to look what did the uh, compiler tell you. So the, also the compiler reveals quite a lot of what, what kind of an optimization uh, the compiler did. So. So from this compiler output and not from the uh, performance analysis tools per se, but from just from the compiler, I can already go, go in and read whether say hotspot loops are being vectorized or not. Also it's possible to determine from the uh, performance analysis data, uh, toolkit data, uh, whether for instance, expensive math operations are taking a lot of time like the exponentials and then uh, hyperbolic functions and so on, uh, as the math operations are definitely not, not equal in, in terms of the uh, cost. 
So this kind of an experiments uh, will be run. So you need a couple of uh, profiling runs or this analysis runs in order to collect all this information. But once you have it, it's, it's possible to identify different kind of fingerprints and then plan the corrective actions accordingly. Uh, and these fingerprints are, for instance, seeing low cash utilizations. That's something if I see numbers like uh, not, not utilizing the L1 cash 100%, it means that uh, there's something they likely can fix and therefore uh, improve the performance. Uh, if the compiler output tells that the vector instruction usage is, or the, or the hotspot loops are not being vectorized, it's just like a gives trace for an uh, for something that you can improve or likely can improve or make it faster. And also, it can be that these these uh, expensive mat operations uh, are high high up in the in the profile, meaning that there are some tricks known as strength strength reduction that we can play in order to make make the code faster so just at this point of time to just perhaps some some uh, notes notes to myself what could be an issue giving a try for it and then then seeing whether it helped or not also from the same data from some of this data uh, we can try to find similar fingerprints for the uh, parallel efficiency of the code. So comparing these two profiles, one may be able to see that uh, the, in fact, the computational routines are getting faster and faster, but the uh, MPA, the proportion MPA time is, is uh, just like increasing such that the code is not doing nothing but MPI anymore. And there's a different <coughs> kind of an, uh, reasons for this kind of a fingerprint and this is something we're gonna uh, elaborate more on the on the third part of the webinar also you can see well like, like i said it's a different kind of a fingerprints uh, that sh should ring us a bell uh, and see what's the where, where does the uh, performance bottleneck is being located um, Basically, if I go to go this through again, so the idea, idea is that uh, the take home messages so far is that, uh, uh, for optimizing a scientific application. Choose a platform that you can really do the, um, do you, well, your science. Select the test case for this optimization work that resembles the intended usage of the software. See, uh, find the scalability limits of the program. Of course, if you are running a single core application, so serial application it doesn't apply, but then you do the other steps here, meaning that uh, you have to instrument and run it with uh, performance analysis tools. So you need to be able to profile the code. And from this profiling data, identifying the single core bottlenecks, <coughs> finding this, uh, different fingerprints. Uh, perhaps if you're running a parallel application, finding the uh, parallel scalability bottlenecks. And then, like I said, drinking coffee, trying to fix this one by one. And once you fix something, see it still correct, see the scalability, see the profile, get back to here, and so on. And loop over as, as, uh, as long as you have the time and energy. And um, so that's basically what I had in mind for today. So just some <coughs> concluding remarks and take home messages, including that uh, uh, you really need to uh, profile the code using external tools before optimizing anything. So optimizing while you write the code is, is really sort of uh, um, sort of a calling for a disaster in a, in a way of, of uh, very obscure code. Uh, so this this old old proverb of premature code optimization is the root of all evil. Um, also, if you don't profile, as in the story in my story in the beginning of the talk, you probably can't 
find by inspection what it's all about. So the user of the code I mentioned was certain it's all about slow random number generation and it didn't have anything to do with random number generation in the, of the performance uh, issues there. It was just like a, a silly, silly mistake um, in the code. So you really need to resort on tools, the performance analysis tools, before optimizing anything. And uh, profile it yourself. So do not believe somebody who has profiled the code like some time ago, because many things may have changed. So just like a work on the current, uh, current version of the code uh, using the data you are going to use, using the system that you are going to use. Uh, meaning, like I said, so profile the code or the hardware you're going to run it. So, so the because the bottlenecks will be different between your laptop and uh, and the uh, Cray XC supercomputer. So if you're going to run it on your laptop, profile it on your laptop. If you're going to run it SISU, run it on SISU or profile it on SISU. And using a uh, good uh, test case that makes sense. And every time you change something, make a new profile because it's, it will be a change. So that's it folks for the, for the uh, first part. So uh, you, like I said, in the beginning, there's an option of doing some hands-on. So this was pretty general considerations uh, on purpose. So, but if you want to find out how to really record a profile from a code, there's a, this kind of a self-consistent uh, document on, on the uh, webinar page that has or it tries to be self-consistent, uh, blame me if, it, if it's not. So there's uh, instructions in the labs.pdf and the code that the uh, exercise is referring to is, is also provided. So the, it basically now on the first four sections, the idea is just like a basically collect, uh, record the profile of the, of the application and in, in fact fix one, one mistake in the, in the code from the beginning. And then on the, on the uh, upcoming, after the upcoming sessions, we're gonna, gonna try some optimizations and tricks onto the same, same code. So uh, thank you any, everybody for listening. I'm happy to uh, take questions. Oh, okay, there's, there's a question. Uh, any differences on using to, to, uh, those tools on Taito versus Sisu? So Taito is our uh, cluster platform and, and Sisu Sisu is our Cray XC supercomputer. So also <coughs> Taito has, well, yes, in, in a way that um, Cray, for instance, Cray, uh, Cray XC won't be, uh, the um, Cray pad won't be available on any pla other places than, than Sisu. So because there's a Cray proprietary tool. Uh, and on Taito, we haven't been that much paying attention for the, for the performance analysis tools, because that's kind of fun. Uh, we sort of think that people who are developing their software are using mostly, mostly Sisu. So yes, there are differences uh, between these platforms and, they, and the labs are written in the, with, with Sisu in mind. And uh, uh, then another question on how does cache profil profiling work. Does one need to add specific hooks uh, to subroutines for that, or the, does the profiler do tools use timing hooks for analyzing cache usage at those times? Uh, the cache profiling works in a way that the, uh, the performance analysis tools uh, take something called ha hardware performance counters. So the CPUs have inbuilt counters for events, what happens in the really on the, on the uh, internal of the of the C, uh, of the CPU so it really counts how many times a memory reference was hit uh, cache memory or it had to fetch it from the main memory for instance so it, it's uh, it comes the cache data comes from the performance analysis tools uh, automatically so the, if you run run a profile with with Cray, but it will provide you the cache metrics for you Thank you for the clarifying question. Uh, thank you again for your attention and time. Uh, we're gonna continue, continue with uh, alleviating this, this oh, sort of a, putting these, these measurements into, into practice.
in the next next talk. So tips and tricks for how to improve a serial application. So single core performance of application. So how how, how to make memory references faster, how to vectorize code better, uh, and so on. And uh, like I said, there's the uh, lab. So if you want to give a give a try with that one, so it will be helping you to uh, follow. I hope the uh, next session as well. Okay, over and out on my behalf. Thanks.